So, so how do I know if I'm growing? See, growth shows us, uh, growth shows up in our lives. See, growth shows up in what we say and what we do. And as we grow in the knowledge of God, our lives will become more godly. As your lives are becoming more godly, you know you are connected to the right vine. Right? And if your life is not growing, if your life is not becoming more godly, how do you know you are connected to the right vine or not? Growth gives us the evidence and assurance that we are having a right relationship with God. So turn your Bibles to Malachi chapter 2, verse 17, and look what these people are saying. Right? Malachi 2, 17. I'm going to read that verse, two, verse 17 through um, chapter 3, uh, 6. So read it with me. You have wearied the Lord with your words. How have we wearied him, you ask? By saying all who do evil are good in the eyes of the Lord. And he is pleased with them. For where is the God of justice? See, I am sending my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant, whom you desire will come, said the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will come, uh, have men who will bring offerings in righteousness, and the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord, as in the days gone by, as in former the years. So I will come near to you for judgment. I will be quick to testify against sorcerers, adulterers, and perjurers, against those who defraud laborers of their wages, who oppress the widows and the fatherless, and deprive aliens of justice, but do not fear me, says the Lord Almighty. I, the Lord, do not change. So you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. So what they're saying here in verse 17 is they're saying, all who do evil are good in the eyes of the Lord, and he is pleased with them. Well, where is God of justice? What, you know, what, what these people are saying is so wrong about God. You know, what, so what do you think about this revelation, this revelation of their heart? heart, heart because out of mouth, our abundance of our hearts and of their mind speak. So <coughs> what they say, it shows us what they're thinking and what is in their hearts. I think it's a multiple layer of this revelation of their heart is so wrong. Right? And so just even there's three things I want to kind of highlight it. Yeah. See, everything they saw uh, was the supreme. Everything was about what they saw at that moment. They probably saw many wicked people perishing. They probably saw you know, right, many righteous people being prospered. But when they see this you know, abnormality or something, right? And so and at that moment, they're making a judgment about God. So when they see this even one case of wicked advancing, doing well, doing well and prospering, and one case of righteous perishing, they're focusing on that one case and they cry out like, wow. So we always say sometimes about sports events, like, oh, man, these referees are paid off. And, and I'm sure they make 10,000 right calls. And that one missed call they make, right? like, oh, this guy is paid off. You know, like, maybe they are, but then the, our focus is that one wrong thing. Right? Even like policemen. I know they have a they're very difficult job, and I'm sure they do like many, many things are right. But then maybe one time they mess up, we're kind of always focusing on that. Like even riding on the airplane, we're being fearful, right? Oh, I'm sure a whole bunch of airlines and a whole bunch of flights do land in the right place. But then if one of them goes wrong, like, oh, I'm not going to fly again. <laughs> right? They live in this kind of fear. I think we do this too all the time. Right? We see wicked prospering and righteous perishing. 
You know, maybe not just one time, but all the time. We see people who cheat and who advances, who lie and do creative wrong things, right? Accountants, you know, doing all this like Anderson. Do you remember all that time, right? In line, they do all these these things, and later they do cut. But at least it seems that they're advancing. And we see Christians being persecuted all over the world. And what we need to remember is that God is in charge and that we have limited knowledge of the things that we do see. And so our trust must be in God, in the things that we even not see, but not just focusing on so much on the little one incident that we do can see. You know, we cannot draw a conclusion about God from this one incident that we have experienced with God, but we need to draw the conclusion about God from the Bible, from what God has done, what God has said from the beginning and until now, even in the Son of God. So our experience is not everything. Right? It's just a one part of the, all the experience in this world. And so another level, this revelation shows us that they are lost, is that they are lost in their conscience for what is right and what is wrong. You know, rather than you know, coming to God and asking God, hey God, I see all these weird things happening, like the book of Habakkuk, right? And coming to a right realization at the end, they're making a conclusion about God, that God is unjust to God. And God you know, is pleased with all these evil doings. That they're not being very humble. They're very prideful in knowing what they think is right is right. And what they think is wrong is wrong. We, we cannot be like that. And we're also the same thing. Right? And especially when you know, allow that we live in a generation, a pluralistic generation, where everybody thinks their own right is right, and everybody thinks that what they're wrong is wrong. It's not like that. You know, what we do as a people of faith that we must get together and we must put the Bible right in the middle in the, in the things and, and, and determining, hey, what do you think based on the revelation of God? What is right? I don't know everything. You don't know everything. But as we together, as we pray, as we seek God, as we you know, invite God's spirit among us in his word, and God will tell us, God will show us what is right and what is wrong. And God is not changing. He knows what is right. He knows what is wrong. It's very weird, you know, I have some Mormon friends. A long time ago, I lived in Merced, there was so many Mormon friends there. And like one year, they, none of them would drink Pepsi or Coke. And then another year, all of them start drinking Pepsi and Coke. And I said, hey, what happened? And I said, oh, our president changed, and, and I heard they bought some stocks in Coke and Pepsi. So it, it changed. So before, they didn't drink any caffeinated drinks. But because of our, you know, we have some financial gains, now we are doing that. What kind of God is that? <laughs> right? right? In verse 6, we know as a God is unchanging God. He never changes. And so when you see that kind of changes in their life, we gotta see, like, oh, you know, it, it is okay to repent that like oh, we're wrong. Right? And, and 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 come back to the right kind of belief system. But what we're seeing in this in, in, in these people here is that. They had their own rights, and they had their own wrongs. Whatever they thought was right is right. Whatever they thought was wrong was wrong. They didn't bother to question their conscience of thinking, hey, I think this is right. Do you think that's right? I think this is wrong. Do you, do you think it's wrong? What do you think? Like being in a community of faith and putting the Bible right in the middle and asking one another in humility and coming up together and determining or discerning what is right and what is wrong, and we are not doing that. Even in Christian community, we're so prideful in the things that we think is right is right, and what other things might right, we think that's wrong. And we are living in a time of confusion because there isn't any set of absolute sense of what is absolutely right and what is absolutely wrong. You know, Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. He doesn't change. He's saying yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And so we must ask Him. We must invite Him in His words, in His spirit, and to tell us what is right and what is wrong. 
Not just stuff going on outside, but stuff going on in our, in our midst. Lord, show us what we need to do. Show us what is right and what is wrong. So many levels that were missing from our So in the very significant level, people are not including themselves in this evaluation. You know, a lot of times that we're very graceful to, right? We're very gracious to ourselves and we're very judgmental to other people. And they were doing the same thing. They were exempt from this evaluation of what is right and what is wrong. And they didn't evaluate their careless worship and evil offering. Right, as we're talking about Malachi chapter 1 and verse ch chapter 2 before the Lord. Right, and God is making that evaluation and he says, look at your offering, look at your careless offering, look at your careless worship. Mm -hmm. If they had the right conscience, right, if they, had, were, they were included in their evaluation, they would say, oh my goodness, what kind of worship are we having before the Lord? What's our attitude? What's our offering? Right? Am I bringing just lame stuff or broken stuff? And this is so wicked. They didn't do that. They didn't include themselves in this evaluation. So in their wickedness, they only saw themselves as the victim of God's careless and injustice and excluded, them, excluded themselves in evaluating their attitude and their worship and their offerings. We do this too. Bible calls this law guy. Not law guy, you know. The log eye. Remember the log eye? Everybody said log eye. Log eye. You know, a lot of times we see speck in people's eyes, like, right? Like, oh, you have a pretty blue eyes. Oh, but there's a little speck right there. Let me try to help you pick that out, right? But what's yet sometimes the reality is that we have a, this beam, telephone pole, sticking out our, our eyes, and what we see is totally wrong. Right? And we're trying to fix somebody, uh, somebody's eyes or somebody's lives. Yeah. We evaluate others' behavior, but we forget to evaluate our behavior. We may see one wicked prospering and quick to judge God, who is not punishing this wicked. This person forgot to judge himself, that we just evaluated, elevated ourselves above God. So a lot of times, when you read the Bible before, Spirit convicts you, like, yeah, you know what, I think that guy, this verse, you know, is about him, and like, he should be more like this. But before that, you got to ask yourself, how about me? What is God speaking to me? Right? A lot of times, teachers, right, we have a pointer and say, like, oh, you, 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 you. But my pastor taught me, like, as you point to people, three of them is pointing back at you. And say, how about me? What's my meaning? A lot of times, you know, I, I'm, I'm a pastor, so I think like, God, my life belongs to you. Right? So we just look at the big rock and those little rocks, and we really don't care that much. But the God cares about the big rocks and the little rocks. Right? Not just my life as a whole to the worship to the Lord, but like, how do I spend like, those little times? Right? What do I think about? Is it worship to the Lord? My preparation, my prayer life. A lot of times, if we have a choice, spending our time in a prayer, prayer closet before the Lord or showing off my giftings, we'll always choose the giftings. Right? Or most of us will choose the giftings. We'll never choose the prayer closet before the Lord, spending that intimate time and communion time with Him. Right? That's us. We are wicked. Not like, oh, these people over here, Three of them are pointing back to you. How about me? <coughs> what kind of misunderstandings that do we have about God? A lot. We get it from our tradition, right? Even in our Baptist tradition, maybe, or some tradition that you belong to. You get it from yourselves. Sometimes you get it from your parents. <coughs> or sometimes you get it from your friends or whoever. But we have to go back to the Bible. We have to go back to the Son of God, Jesus Christ, to get the right kind of information about God that will give us the right kind of belief system about God so that we can have eternal life. Because if you don't have the right belief system, belief system, you will perish. That's that important. What you believe, what you know about God. It will either drive you destruction or eternal life. Wide is the gate that leads to destruction. Narrow is the gate that leads to life. 
right? Right? So it's not just about, you know, and so what you say, what you say about God reveals your mind and the heart about God. So, so, so examine your lives. What do you say about God? You know, do you just say about God nice things on Sunday mornings as we sing these wonderful songs? Blessed be your name. Oh, hallelujah. You know? Oh, God, you are great. You are just amazing. You love me so much. You are so holy. Do you just say that in the Sunday mornings? Or how about your Monday mornings? Oh, I have to go to work. Oh, God. <laughs> I wish it was Sunday. You know? I hate Mondays. What do, you, what do you say that? Are you saying that God is not the Lord of Monday? What we say about life, what we say about God, what we say about one another, what we say about this world reveals about your heart, your mind, about God. Because God is the Lord of all. Amen? Amen. He is. God is the one who gave you your marriage. He was there. We talked about that last Sunday. God is the Lord of your life. God knows exactly where you are. God knows. God has placed you in your workplaces. God has placed you in your school places. So what you say about your life, about your time, about your circumstances, reveals your mind and your heart about God. It talks about, it reveals your theology. It talks about, it reveals about you and God in your relationship with them and your belief system. And that can either lead you to destruction, perishing, or eternal life. For some of you, I don't say anything about God. What does it reveal? You have nothing about God. You know nothing about God. You perish. You say incorrect things about God. You have wrong belief system. You perish. But if you're growing in what you say, <coughs> And in what in the right things about God you are saved. Because if you're growing in your relationship with God, in the fuller expression of who God is, it tells you, it gives you assurance that you are in right relationship, that you are connected to the right vine. And that gives you assurance and power to live this life. That you know that you are a son, that you know you are a daughter of God. That's the first revelation. We only have two revelations. A short message. But second revelation has many parts. Sorry. Yeah. Second revelation is from chapter 3, verse 1 through 6. And it's about, about his character. Revelation about his character. See, God knows about injustice. God knows about our wickedness and this sinful world. God knows about our messed up <coughs> conscience. This messed up world is a big problem in this world. God is not going to destroy the world again by flood and start over with one family like he did the days of Noah. Because he told us he's never going to do that again. Right? But God's solution begins with verse 1. It says, See, I will send my messenger. Right? And that messenger is John the Baptist. I'm not going to take time to explain. Who will prepare the way before me? Right? And so it's, it's, it's interesting to know that why does he say before me? He could have said before Messiah, before Christ, or before something. But he, so he interchanges me and this person that God's going to send as the Messiah. And then so a lot of times that people say, oh yeah, Old Testament doesn't talk about Trinity at all. Well, he has Trinity all over him. He's just not looking for it. Right? So right here, you know, the, this is my messenger. He's a John the Baptist. Who will prepare a way, the way before me? So this me and who's speaking is the same person. Right? Who is this me here? It's God. Right? So then suddenly the Lord, right? You know, when the Bible says the Lord, it's not talking about Elijah or John the Baptist, who can be called the Lord. But who can be called the Lord except God himself? It's God. Who are seeking, who you are seeking, will come to his temple. Can anybody say that's mine? I, I guess sometimes I'm comfortable when people say, oh yeah, I'll go to Pastor Young's church. It's not like my church, you know. <laughs> you know? It's, it's, right? I, it's our church. It's, it's, it's God's church. It's God's bride. Jesus' is bride is not mine. You know, I, I know what you mean, but sometimes I get a little bit like you know uneasy about that. And who can say it's his temple? 
This is very obvious point that this person has the quality of the ownership of the temple, which is God. In three ways, right? We're saying Jesus, God saying that this Christ, this Messiah, is going to be God. It's God. This problem is so big, right? That it doesn't, it, it, need, it requires God himself to come and fix it. Right? And so when you look at yourself, when you look at the world and how messed up it is, and even how, how we're messed up, uh, you know, remember the side note is that, you know how we're trying to decide a new name for our church when we came together? You know, I want to name, name our church, uh, we have a problem church. <laughs> <laughs> we do have a problem. The problem is so big, it's not just your will is going to change it, new method is going to change it, a new pro program is going to change it. It requires God to come and change it. And you can look at one another, you even look at yourself, God, wow, God, I need you. I need you to come and change this life. You know, right? You know, and a lot of times when you're in a public place, you may think yourself as like certain level. But you know, when, when I sit down with you, and when I just ask you a couple of questions, you know, like, oh, I'm such a loser. <laughs> you know, you know, like, oh, man, I'm hopeless, you know? Yeah. Without Christ, we are hopeless. But with Christ, He gives us hope. He gives the hope. Problem is so big that it requires God Himself to come. And fix it. And God is so loving and faithful. And He just doesn't send more angels. Oh, this is a job for like 10,000 angels. Or, or, oh man, this problem is twice as big as the last one. Let's send 20,000 angels. No. He loves us so much that He comes Himself. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, one illustration is that you know, when I was in college, I used to think. Our missionaries need just more money. So we just think like, oh, let's just collect more money and just send them. Right? So many times, many places, I went to Africa, I went to Pakistan, I went to many different places. And, and all those places that I go, they, one common thing they say is that, you know, I don't earn money. I know money God can provide. But people who really care about us, they come. And they see and they encourage us. Mm -hmm. you know, we think, oh yeah, they just need money and send them. Very pragmatic kind of thinking. But they say, well, people who love us, people who care for us, they'll come and they'll visit us. And they say the same thing in, in Pakistan. They just don't want me to just send them money, but they don't come and visit and have a relationship with them. <coughs> right? And we think about this great commission, right? Go make, go and make disciples of all. Nation. He just didn't say, go and send money <laughs> to all the nations. No. Go and make. Right? And so there's a book called Great Commission, and there's so many books called Great Omission. Meaning like we have opt out of going, but just opt into sending money. I'm not saying don't send money, but yes, send money, but go too. Because that is the Great Commission. People love and care for us when they come and visit us. We are loved and cared in that God came and came and visited us. And He loves us. And that shows us the magnitude of our problem, but also God's infinite love for us. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a job for a angels to do. God Himself had to come. So it talks about God's faithfulness in sending Jesus Christ, sending himself, the second person in the Trinity, to fix us, to give us hope. That's the first one. Verse 2 to 4, it talks about God's righteousness. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? The right, rhetorical answer is no one. Why? Because he's so holy and so perfect and so beautiful and so amazing that no one can stand in front of him and be alive. For he's so holy. Right? Like, have you seen like, right, you know, like maybe athlete? Like I, I heard Carl Lewis, right? You know, he's an old day like athlete. He can long jump by what, 22 feet? Like almost 8, eight meters? How, how far is that from that wall right there, the clock, to this 
podium right here. Do you think how far is that from here? Jack, what do you think? Uh, 30, 36 feet. 36 feet, yeah. No, I'm just guessing. Yeah, I'm just guessing. <laughs> what do you think? This way? Yeah, this way. Like, 30. This is like... It's a construction management right there. <laughs> <laughs> Right? But then you just imagine, he can jump eight feet. He can, he can long jump eight feet. You know? And, like, I don't know, some of you guys can, are pretty good athletes, and you go to, you know, if the car goes right next to your life, you know, I can jump like two, two meters, you know, three meters. Do you know, don't you know who you're talking to? Right? I mean, if you're standing next to Michael Jordan, would you brag about your, like, you know, high school record, you know? <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's it just it, anybody who's famous, who's really good at something. Like, I met Chuck Liddell the other day. You know, Chuck Liddell, he used to be the champ, MMA, I think MMA, or something like that. Right? Right? I mean, like, you, you see, yeah, he's like a local celebrity, right? If you see him, like, what do you say? Like, you know, yeah, you want to fight? You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know I'm so, you know. Uh, but if he's, he's come, his son comes and you know my son is like, oh, it's okay, son. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not gonna say like all the son. No. <laughs> what are you gonna say? Yeah. But even in God's creation, in this vast universe of 14, you know, billion light years size, like, what do you say to God? And that kind of incidence. <clears throat> what can we say? God, you're great. And that's why one of the songs says, you know, if you are face to face God, what would you say? Would you say nothing? Yeah, maybe. Because it's so great and so wonderful, and you may say nothing. You have no words to describe who he is. You know? So God's righteousness. You know what that is? Is that, that God is so right. And so he in in, in, in Jesus. He's doing the work of righteousness to make people right. He's so righteous that he just doesn't allow people to perish, but he's coming. He has come to work in us for us to be right. He's making us right. It's not your will. It's not like I need to do this, but that's what he says. It's, it's a, but who can endure it? They of his coming. Who can stand when he appears? And no one, right? And, and it continues on. For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness. And the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord. As in the former days. God's going to make it right. He is the refiner's fire. Right? So I brought a silver coin. I, I remember I love talking about silver coins. Just 99.999 fine silver, one ounce of it. Right? How, 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 do you, how does this make it? How does it make What happens? You heat it up. Refiner's fire and the dross and other impurities will float up and you will be taken away. And only the pure silver is left over. And how does the servers of it know? And they say, and when I can see my face, and this is exactly how he's saying, he is the artist, he is the smith right here, but who is refining the gold and silver. And as he sees his reflection in that silver or gold, he said, this is ready. This is pure gold, and this is pure silver. This is what he does. It's not like telling the silver, hey, work better, try harder. What are you doing? And that's how we do Christianity, right? And so people who are more disciplined, they seem more spiritual. People who are not disciplined, they seem less spiritual. Right? But that's not the way it happens. It is work of God, Christ himself, who comes and works in us and makes us right. And it's, a, it's more of a matter of taking Christ, be more reigning in our lives as a refiner's fire. So in that two settings, God ordained refining of training. You know, I'm trying to run a marathon. And man, that, you know, when I was younger, man, running is easy. Just run, you know. We eat while we're, we're, we're running and eating at the same time. You know, and now, man, you got to like eat at the right place. And because if you don't, you know, you'll be burping all the time that you, you're running and it's painful. 
right? And he's training. And when you're little, you don't have to train. But First Corinthians 9, 25 tells you, everyone who competes in the game goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man, you know, beating the air. No, I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. We're like an athlete training for the glory of God. So God ordained refining of training. We need to train ourselves. Is your body the Lord of your life? Or is your spirit who is connected to God is the Lord of your life? So I know some cold people say, when you run, don't listen to your body. He said, listen to your mind. That needs to go on. Right? And I think my I reply is like that. You know, I'm getting too old. I don't hear anything. <laughs> you know? I just need to run. That's it, you know. Right? And yeah. God ordained me finding us. So are you living a life of training? Or are you just letting go of your life? We need to be trained as a refining of process. And also there is this God allowing, God allowing refining of suffering. 1 Peter 1.6 talks about, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a while, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. There's all kinds of, various different kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Christ is, when Jesus Christ is revealed. So God allowed these kind of suffering things to happen to refine our faith. So there's training factor, right? You know, then there are also suffering factor. And through those things, God refines us to be more like Him. And that is work of Christ in our lives. So as you experiencing training, Right? And I say, okay, guys, you know, let's, let's, when we go to mission, let's do a training. Let's do this, let's do the training. I have a morning prayer, it's a, it's a training. Right? Fasting is a training. Right? All these kind of things, giving is a training. All these things, uh, opportunity for us to train. But sometimes we just neglect it. Like, oh, I don't need to train. By what we say, we reveal about. You know, we want to be trained. Why? Because through our training, through our life, glory of God will be revealed. So if you have a high view of God's glory, and your motivation and your perspective is all about God's glory, you will be trained. You want to be trained. So that God's glory may be reflected through our lives. Because that much more, you value God's glory than your comfort and what your desire is. So if you desire God's glory, you want to be trained. And you go through suffering with joy, it says. In this, you greatly rejoice. For a little while, for a little 60, 70, 80 years, you go through that. Next, God's character is justice. Right? Verse 5, it talks about, So I will come near you for judgment. I will be quick to testify against sorcerers, adulterers, and perjurers, against those who defraud laborers of their wages, who oppress the widows, and the fatherless, the depraved uh, uh, aliens of justice, and do not fear you. People who do not fear, says the Lord, all, Lord Almighty. You know, I think there's imbalance of things that we really hate compared to what we just hate a little bit. And again, that depends on our tradition. Right? So we need to, a fresh set of eyes to really shock us again what God is really saying regarding these kind of things. We see these kinds of lists in Romans chapter 1, Galatians chapter 5. So when we see these kind of listings, we should shock us. Especially those things that doesn't shock us, it should shock us still. Maybe you would think very relaxed about it. Relaxed about these things. But some things we're very strict about. Why are we? Right? Talk about greed and stuff like that. As a conservative, sometimes we don't really care about greed at all. It's all about capitalism. Come on. But sometimes the liberals, what? They take so seriously about greed. But they take so lax about sexuality. Right? 
Oh, it's like an appetite. You get hungry, you eat. I go, what? It's much more deeper than that. So whenever we see these kind of lists, it should shock us equally, like bam, bam, bam. Wow, wow this kind of thing, like wow, what's going on? Perjurers, right? Lying people. Well, those white lies, you know, I don't really, really lie, but just those light ones, you know? You know, I cross my fingers and stuff like that, I think it's a big deal. No, right? I mean, sorcerers, the spiritual realms, the theological triangle, right? Or the, the sexuality, the social, and the, in the ways that we care for the, you know, the widows and the, and, the, and the orphans and the aliens, right? And who do not fear God. God's justice, and God will come, and he will judge them all. And verse 1 of, uh, of verse 6 talks about the immutability of God. God never changes. Right? I, the Lord, do not change. So you, or descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. See, he's a refining fire, not a destroying fire. You know, we have forest fires all the time right, in California in summer. It just destroys houses and all over. Right? But going back to the beginning of this book, God says to them, I have loved you. Remember that? I have loved you. Nothing can separate us from his love. And going back to the beginning of the Bible, and God is saying that you are created in my image. And I love you. I have a plan for you. I have a purpose for your life. You, what you're seeing here is not everything. And I'm going to do a new thing. Don't focus on what you see, but focus on me. Focus on my character. If you do not understand me correctly, you will misbelieve me. You will disbelieve me. You will not believe me. That leads you to destruction and perishment. But you need to know me right for you to experience eternal life. As the band come up, you know, I think we really need to experience God in these last days. We, we need to experience this fresh breath of God that He is faithful God. He is a faithful God. Everybody say that. He's a faithful God who just did not send us angel, but He has come Himself. You know, like, remember I told you I went to Mexico? On the way back, we're thinking like, why don't we do this? We're sitting in the traffic, carbon monoxide, you get headaches, and some people even throw up, right? But why do we do this? We do it for the glory of God. You know, you go to the Philippines, right? 16 hours, 20 hours, spending $2,000 on an airplane, going to Africa, spending 38 hours, layovers, and all kinds of stuff. Why? Why do we do this? Because, because God is faithful to us. And God gave up heaven to come. And we can give up San Francisco for two, two, three, four weeks to experience the what? Humility? Oh, humility? I think God gives us humility for humility's sake, you know? <laughs> He's a faithful God. He comes himself. He's a righteous God. He's right God. He's working in us so that we can be right. And it's an amazing work. As God grows us to be like Him. And He's a just God. He will judge. He's a judging God. Daniel means that God is my judge. And He's unchanging God. You know, if our understanding of God is wrong, we will perish. And what we say about God, what we say about life, what we say about our time, about our relationships, it reveals a lot about our understanding of God. If that understanding is correct, if your belief system is right, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you will have eternal life. But if you don't, you will perish. And I want to end our time by singing our last song, you know, really directing him, directing ourselves, and, and crying out to the Lord that he is righteous, and that his righteousness makes us right. He is working in us to make us right before him. He's making us to be like Him. And He has to do the cleansing and comforting in our lives to make us holy and pleasing unto Him. Let's all stand up together.
loose him with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. In your quiet prayer closets, in, in, in your schools, in your workplaces, for you to seek him, for you to experience that God can make your hearts and your hands clean, that reflects that God's holiness, that our worship will be right before him. As I cry out to him once again, through our songs. Lord, you're the one. You're the righteous one. You need, I need you. I don't need another program. I don't need things. I don't need whatever. I need you to come and make me pure.
just said that one more time. <laughs> and just, you know, if you want to say a prayer um, based on how God's working, you know, like five minutes, you know. I don't want to let you go early. This is my precious hour and 15 minutes, uh, you know. Uh, let's just take some time for prayer, right? You know, express how hard you want to come before Him. Like, cry out unto Him. We need to experience this pure heart that God wants to make you. Let's be really serious and let's pray. Whoever wants to pray, let's pray. One more person. One more person. Well, thank you for speaking to me today, Lord, and for everybody else in this church. Thank you, God, for your faith and maybe love us and talk to us and care about us and be merciful and kind and loving and forgiving and enjoy your ministry. Thank you, God, for Jesus. Father, you have given us your Son and your Word. And you have promised us that if we believe in Him, we will not perish, but have everlasting life. So, Father, we cry out unto you for us to cling on to your revelation of your Son and your Word, that we may know you right and experience this great salvation, great eternal life that you have given unto us. May we continue to grow in our relationship with you, that we know that we have assurance that we are yours and yours forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Perfect. God bless you all.